Uh, welcome to the Korea Economic Institute of America. My name is Kyle Ferrier. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs and Research here. Thank you, Florence. Uh, <laughs> uh, today's program is really a, quite a timely one, considering the evolving threat uh, that Japan, the United States, and South Korea face from North Korea. But in the past two years, we've seen a number of really positive developments in the trilateral relationship, particularly on the, the Japanese-South Korean relationship side. Uh, but there are some major questions that will, be need, will need to be addressed as we look to the South Korean election next month. And as we look forward to that, uh, we're very happy to have with us today uh, two very, very uh, um, well-regarded uh, scholars on these issues. <laughs> Brad may disagree, but I think he's being quite modest. Um, we, uh, we have Brad Glosserman uh, of Pacific Forum CSIS and Scott Snyder of CFR. Uh, I don't want to go through the full, their full bios uh, for the sake of time, so please feel free to refer to the flyer uh, for their full background. Uh, they are also the uh, authors of the Japan and South Korea Identity Clash. The paperback just came out recently, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, uh, Brad will be writing a paper for us after the election. Uh, so Brad will be the focus of today's uh, focus of today's program. He will offer some remarks for about a half hour or so, and uh, uh, Scott will then have the opportunity to act, serve as a discussant to comment on some of those the points that he made. So please, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Brad Glossman and S Scott Snyder. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, it's I, I'm I'm from the part of CSIS that's that didn't used to be in this building, and isn't on 16th and Rhode Island. I'm from the the part of CSIS that's in Hawaii, which means basically right now is about usually when I'm waking up in the morning. Um, so if I'm a little um, bumpy, it's because my brain is still trying to catch up with the with my body. Um, I want to thank KEI for having me, Troy and Scott, uh, Troy and, and, and Kyle, sorry. Very, like I said, uh, it, very brave of you to invite me to give me a, a, a public uh, platform to speak, uh, especially with Scott, um, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, for a number of reasons, not least of which is the fact that my background primarily is a Japan guy. And so uh, it, it's a, a, perhaps a slightly different angle of attack on issues within which I think you're probably very, very uh, familiar with. Um, I wanted to say, you know, also, it's, it's nice to be back at KEI, except I've never been to KEI before, so thank you for having, thanks for having me here for the first time and, 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 and offering me the, the chance to speak. Um, as, as Kyle mentioned, this is our book. Um, buy it. Number one, because it's a very good book. <laughs> Number two, because Scott and I both have very small children that we have, and we really, really need those royalty checks. So, um, the, um, and we will sign them if you buy them. Um, we, when, we first, when the book first came out, we did a, uh, a, a program up at the uh, Korea Society yeah, in New York. And the book actually was not even published yet. And a young woman came up, and we were autographing some of the copies that we'd managed to get in advance. And a woman came up and gave me her Kindle and asked me just to sign the back of it because she would be downloading it shortly, which I thought was one of the, the more ambitious um, uh, kind of gestures. And I, uh, interesting. I, I wonder. I didn't see any other signatures. I don't know if she gets a Kindle for each book or what, or, but in this case, at least we're the only people that the book she downloaded that, that she'd met the authors. Um, I would also say buy the book because it's right. I mean, uh, Scott and I, working with Scott was, was, a, was a delight and a wonder and experience. And I'm, I'm amazed that our friendship survived the, the many, many years it took us to get this, into this version. But one of the battles is that, we, that he and I constantly have is I like to be bold and thinking ahead and really trying to push the envelope and suggestions. And Scott is, for those of you that don't know, I'm a fairly cautious kind of person who doesn't uh, really enjoy the risk taking that I've founded my career upon. Um, and so that tension defined a lot of our working relationship. And so I really tried to push Scott in a lot of ways, and I think to make some bold suggestions. And I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that I was right, um, which is always I'm pleased to say that. But some of, I think, the, you know, the, the, the primary thesis of our book 
which is, is that national identity issues have become more important in Northeast Asian politics, and particularly in the, in the relationship between these two countries. And that it is, I think, forces us to rethink some of the bedrock assumptions about the way that security policy is made, have, have been validated. And while it's, you know, we would never claim that identity issues are determinative and are monocausal uh, explanations, I think, for security policy anywhere, nevertheless, I think they take on a far greater salience and a greater weight than most of us would give credit to. And so that overarching thesis, I think, is, is really, really important. And, and you know, we see this, that even as the North Korean threat intensifies, you still see a great deal of weight given to what we consider identity issues in the politics of both countries. And it, this clearly, as, as I'll try to explain, and I think as you all know, the trilateral relationship, the US, Japan, South Korea, and the it's ROK, Japan relationship is still in, inextricably linked with these identity questions in ways that, you know, f frankly, if you want to be an academic, that the realists would find, I think, a bit perplexing. So um, I think we're, we're, we're pleased to see that. And, and, and I would, I think, as we all know, the upcoming election in, in, in South Korea will, I think, as well, be turning on many, many critical identity issues. Um, and so I, I'm pleased to say that, that it, if nothing else, the, the, the overarching thesis of the book is correct. And then secondarily, the recommendations that we made, I think, particularly the ones that we, we, I, I pushed to stick our neck out on, have been validated. So for example, one of the things that we suggested was a deal on comfort women. And I think you know, we've seen that clearly. Uh, in fact, we, I'd like to think that the, the, the actual agreement borrowed, got its nudge from us, but I don't think that's true. Um, I would argue similarly that Obama's visit to Hiroshima to talk about nuclear, you know, nuclear weapons, and the reciprocal visit by Prime Minister Abe to Pearl Harbor reflects the, the logic that animated our, 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 our proposals, which is essentially the United States in particular needs to be taking a more forward-leaning position, needs to be pushing the rewriting, if you will, of the historical narratives, and it begins by setting an example. And I think that that, again, that too has been um, as largely uh, yeah, validated. The third point as well is that we sort of saw it incumbent upon Japan to reach out and to, if you will, put the burden upon South Korea. And I think that the characterization of Japanese policy over the last few years has been precisely that. That you've seen the Japanese, I think, pushing the bounds of what many considered possible because it was the right thing to do, but also because there was, I think, in lurking in the back of many Japanese uh, strategists' mind, was the fact that it really needed to be us to, 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 to do what we could so that we would, there, that if things went south or went sour, we would not be responsible and we wouldn't be blamed. And I think, again, that too has largely been validated. Um, the one thing that, I would, that I'm not sure about, and I may be being too cute by half, and this was not in either of the notes that I sent you when I sent them the, my, my talking points, is I was wondering to the degree to which some of the, the push on, Jap on Japan's part to really, really press for trilateral engagement and to really work on the North Korean problem is not in itself as well an expression of Japan, a particular expression of Japanese identity. In other words, if you have conversations with the Japanese about North Korean threats, they will tell you that they consider themselves the most likely target of a North Korean nuclear weapon. And this is, when we discuss strategic issues like that, that's one of the standard tropes that the Japanese will, will a case that they'll make. And that's probably correct. And I'm wondering if, in fact, that the Japanese press for trilateral engagement and overcoming some of these other issues is not, weirdly enough, this notion of extreme vulnerability on the part of the Japanese and this victim, if, one way to, to, to I think characterize it might be a victim consciousness on the part of the Japanese is also a, a, a component of the, of the identity uh, narrative within Japan. And that, eh, I'm not real comfortable with that, but I wanted to throw it out just because I'm always looking for ways to validate my logic. Um, so I think in the large context, that's why you should buy the book. Because we were right, I think we stuck our necks out on it, and I, I take a great deal of solace in, in having pushed Scott way out of his comfort zone, as you can tell. He's very uncomfortable with this kind of commentary anyway. So where does this leave us today? And I guess, number one, you know, the, 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 over, the, the sense that trilateralism is, is being pursued. You know, apparently, and, and the timeline that I, that I looked at as I was trying to prepare these remarks, pretty much since December of last year, you know, as, as Secretary of State Kerry was preparing to go out and leave office, you know, he was, 
he, w he was reported at least that he was reaching out both to Seoul and to Tokyo to tell them that he was worried about the prospects for continuing um, uh, 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 trilateral cooperation. Um, and this was, of course, following the Comfort Girl statute um, and that he was expressing a U.S. readiness to continue to press. And I, I leave it to, to better informed sources than, than, than I have at this point as to how much this administration is, in fact, pushing the envelope. And because if you talk to people that are, that are doing the groundwork, they will tell you that the Comfort Women deal was very much a function of behind-the-scenes American prodding. And there's been, in so many of the trilateral meetings that have taken place over the last couple of years, really it, it, the U.S. element uh, and the degree to which we have, Washington has been pushing the three countries together, and particularly Tokyo and, Tol has, Tokyo and Seoul, has been extremely important in making this happen. Um, and so the degree to which that will continue, I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not clear. Um, You've had Trump and Abe affirm the value of trilateralism at their February summit in Mar-a-Lago. And in fact, if you look at all the, it's part now of the diplomatic boilerplate. Every time a senior U.S. official meets with a Japanese official or a Korean official, they're always applauding and always putting forward the idea that we will be working together. And typically, uh, I think identifying explicitly the other as a partner as opposed to merely just referring to the value of trilateralism. There was a February trilateral ministerial at the G20 summit. In February of 27, February, uh, late February, the six-party talks envoys got together in, uh, in here. Tillerson, when he made his visit to Asia, talked up trilateralism. There were the defense trilateral talks in uh, April. And when the vice president was in Seoul, he too made the point at which they, again, as part of the boilerplate, we're going to push bilateral and trilateral coordination with Japan. And then you've had the six-party talks on boys that met on Monday, I believe, here in this town. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, met in Tokyo to talk about, uh, again, coordination vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. That, frankly, for me, is kind of the lowest common denominator and not an extremely high bar. I am increasingly pleased to see um, the military piece of that particular equa trilateral equation going as well. So you've had, in January, joint naval missile defense drills with, it, with um, all three countries that use their Aegis um, uh, destroyers. That missile, They conducted a missile detection and tracking drills in the waters off the divided peninsula in Japan. Uh, this was, there's some confusion here, but according to most of the sources that this was the third in a series of drills that have taken place both in June, and previous ones in June and November of 2015. In March, there was another Aegis exercise. Uh, two of the three ships were the same. I think the US uh, guided missile destroyer uh, was a different one. Um, a trilateral missile warning information link exercise. April 3rd, significantly, everyone is quite, is talking up what was a trilateral anti-submarine warfare uh, drill. And that has um, gotten a lot of attention because it's a level of operational, I think, of planning and coordination that has, at, 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 to that point, was unprecedented. So um, what is also interesting is, is that m that exercise was originally supposed to have been held in December and it was canceled, or postponed at least, and then actually took place in April. So it's a, it, it, it suggests at least that there is a perception, at least among the militaries and their political overlords, that whatever may have inhibited and kept them from holding this, this uh, the cir circumstances had changed sufficiently since December to allow them to proceed. Um, and given, frankly, you know, given the political situation in Seoul, it's, it's kind of a surprising conclusion. So it would only lead me, at least, to believe that the North Korean threat had uh, intensified to a point where it seemed to make far more compelling uh, that sort of exercise. Um, so if that's the good story, what's the downside? And obviously, yeah, I think it, it's the, the tension in the relationship between Seoul and Tokyo. Um, and as you all know better than I, and I don't think there's much reason to recite that here, uh, the immediate concern and cause of the tensions have, has been the, the Comfort uh, Girl statue in Busan. Um, and as you know, Japan both withdrew the ambassador and the consul general in Busan. And then I think in a interesting and revealing uh, development, and one that I think also goes back to the points I was making at the outset, uh, Tokyo swallowed its pride, and despite a complete lack of progress, as best I can tell, and certainly in the official statements from the Japanese, decided, in fact, that they would send both the, the ambassador back. Um, and it was based on the judgment, this is according to the Japanese press, 
that the stalemate in Japan are okay relations must end because Japan needs information in preparation for the change of government in Seoul and maintain cooperation among the growing threat posed by North Korea, even though the foreign minister conceded that no results have been made. And I think that, you know, the juxtaposition, the acknowledging the strategic reality and then at the same time conceding that nothing has happened that would give Japan at least the fig leaf to proceed, I think is, is a, a striking admission on the part of Tokyo. And the decision was made and has been laid at the prime minister's foot, that it was Abe himself who was responsible for the decision. And um, this is, comes after close associates of the prime minister had said the ball was in Seoul's court and that, the, and that J Tokyo was prepared to wait out South Korea to, for it to make some sort of gesture that would otherwise overcome this particular problem. Um, and then, and I'm, I'm citing here the Japanese press, the, uh, a, a senior government official's comment was, the situation now has become one in which we cannot be talking about which court the ball is in, which is a reference, of course, to the original statement that the ball is now in, in South Korea's court. So I think this is, a, a given, given the extraordinary sensitivity that's attending to the politics of Northeast Asia and to the relationship with South Korea in Tokyo, I think that's a pretty impressive climb down on the part of the Japanese and one that speaks to, a, I think, a genuine both maturity in Tokyo as a, a, a desperation and concern as well. And I think it also speaks to this, the, the larger logic both of security relationships and a perception on Japan's part that it needs to be seen as doing everything possible to address these particular problems. Um, at the same time, while we've seen movement on security, the currency swap agreement, apparently those talks have been derailed. Um, the, the ambassador was hoping that he was going to meet the acting president, and that meeting has not taken place as far as I'm aware. Uh, that he was, the request was denied, saying that it wouldn't fit protocol. Most people in Japan, or most of the, the media and informed sp sources speculate that the domestic political backlash would not have permitted it, that it just, it, it, looked, it would look too craven. Um, and uh, nevertheless, the foreign ministry in South Korea is, says that it remains committed to the original Comfort Women Agreement and that it will continue to implement the deal. The Japanese, quite frankly, are extremely concerned about the idea that, you, that all of the candidates so far seem to be opposed to the Comfort Women Agreement and that there's not, it's, its survival, I think, is considered to be uh, in jeopardy. And frankly, the conservatives in Japan are pretty irritated as well because it, they're, they, um, they would prefer to beat up, I think, on South Korea than acknowledge the strategic necessity of, of, of dealing with, uh, of Seoul, with Seoul rather than standing on these particular principles. Um, mind you, uh, we had this week, I believe, a, another example of the uh, sensitivity with the publication of the Diplomatic Blue Book, which of course acknowledged the problems uh, surrounding the um, Dokuto Takeshima ownership problem. Um, the minister was called in, the, the, the minister counselor from the embassy was called into the foreign ministry in uh, Seoul and, and yelled at. And it retains, however, the Blue Book also does retain language on uh, Japan's, calling South Korea Japan's most important neighbor, a little, um, you know, a, a fill-up in the description of the relationship between the ROK and Japan that had disappeared for a couple of years, but was, I think, was, was reinstated last year and continues to be part of the, the if you will, the boilerplate. And I think, um, while I'm, I'm inclined always to be dismissive of diplomatic boilerplate, the fact is, is that this language is not fixed in stone and can be lifted out and does seem to have significance. So I think we should, should applaud it as we can. I would also note, one again, one of the recommendations in the book that hasn't happened and frankly I don't think will, is we call on Japan to actually renounce its claim to Takeshima Dokdo. Uh, because to our mind, to my mind at least, I'm not sure where Scott stands on this, um, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, the Japanese do not have control, uh, that they have renounced the, the uh, resolution of this by anything except a diplomatic means and thus all they're doing by continually uh, making the claim as they do is I suppose throw a sop to the right and ensure that there is a, a perennial irritant in uh, the relationship with, between Seoul and Tokyo. And quite frankly having Japan move forward in that way and I think to, to make a, a principled declaration uh, and there are ways to work it without prejudicing the other claims. It would really, again, give Japan the moral high ground and help it to really establish some principles for dispute resolution, territorial dispute resolution in East Asia as a whole. It'd be a, a really profound gesture, but I'm not holding my breath. 
Um, so the uncertainties now, uh, as we uh, looking ahead, obviously number one, there is about the United States. You know, and I mentioned that when Kerry was leaving office, Secretary Kerry was leaving, he had called his partners to say that they, that they you know, the U.S. good offices would continue to be available, uh, that uh, we would continue to press and be, it would be pushing for trilateral engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my concern, of, of course, about U.S. foreign policy is on several levels at this moment. The first is the absence of strategy, per se. Um, we certainly don't have a document. So now I, while we have the continuation of, in many ways, traditional policy, I think, globally, nevertheless, it is not clear to me how this administration, collectively and strategically, thinks about Asia, about alliances, about North Korea. Um, I mean, we have approaches, but none of those strike me as a coherent package, and so I'm concerned about that, number one. Number two, I'm worried about the degree to which the United States is prepared to engage generally as a mediating force. And of course, related to that is the degree to which the United States is prepared to continue as the uh, pace setter, if you will, for historical reconciliation and for trying to set new boundaries and, and I think set new examples for ways that countries should be engaging uh, in dealing with the past. And third, um, it is unclear to me how transactional this administration is going to be, and particularly in the context of our relationship with China, and to what degree that South Korea and Japan will become bargaining chips in larger geopolitical or bilateral games, uh, as has been suggested by the President when he talks about the currency manipulation, which we all know is not going to happen. What that particular declaration and then the readiness to trade that off for increased Chinese engagement vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And I think that that speaks to a larger set of questions about just the way that this administration will be using, what, what, what bargaining chips does it have, will it, it try to use, and, and frankly just how it will be conducting its foreign policy. Um, obviously the second great uncertainty is the South Korean presidential election. Um, the optimists in Japan, the most optimistic people I've spoken to in, a, as, in preparing for these remarks, say it's going to be an uphill struggle, but uh, the shared sense of strategic necessity will not fade away regardless of the out outcome of this particular vote. There will be people in Japan who will be pressing, and in the government, who will be pressing, pressing for greater engagement, greater cooperation, uh, regardless of, of how difficult South Korea proves to be as a partner. But I do think there are limits to tolerance and limits to the uh, opportunity costs, if you will, of pressing South Korea. So I think there needs to be some understanding of the potential limits that are involved. And then third, um, I think another interesting component of this is the Northeast Asian trilateral dynamic, which is no between Japan, China, and, and South Korea. Uh, the summit that Japan was supposed to host in December, the trilateral summit has, uh, was canceled because of the political pressures. Um, there is the, I noticed that the FTA negotiations, however, apparently have continued to meet over the last couple of weeks. Um, there is considerable concern, quite frankly, in Japan uh, about the drift in Seoul, the potential drift in real. When Scott and I were doing the initial um, uh, uh, presentations on the book, we did a program at the uh, Corresp uh, Foreign Correspondence Club in Tokyo. And this was right in the middle of a, uh, 19, in 2015, right? So it was great concern in Tokyo at that point, which I thought was overblown, but nevertheless fairly well rooted uh, in the belief that, that even at that point with the Park government, you were seeing the beginnings of a drift and the unmooring of South Korea from the alliance with the United States. And I think, you know, in retrospect, we've seen that that was all exaggerated. But nevertheless, there is, a, I think, a, a deeper fear in Tokyo. And we were trying very hard to address and I think, you know, suggest that that was mistaken. But nonetheless, there is a readiness to believe that in Tokyo. And I think that that belief is intensified with the potential election results. And I think, um, you know, as, as my Japanese friends would tell you, that the Kore Japan's policy towards Korea is increasingly being seen as part of Japan's policy toward China. Um, and that Japanese decisions, I think, are being driven very much by that particular you know, triangulation. So the, 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 the return of the ambassador to Seoul, as well as the, you know, the lack of a hard retaliation for what is perceived as a fairly offensive gesture, nevertheless reflect broad strategic thinking, and I use that word literally, strategic thinking in Tokyo about the nature of Japanese foreign policy and its position within the region. 
Now that takes me to my final topic, which is the future Asia strategies, which for me is the most interesting component of this discussion, but it's the one in which I am speculating the most. And it is the one um, that has the potential to get me in the most trouble. Um, I have a very particular view of Japan, and I'm something of an outlier. Uh, I believe that we are experiencing what I like to call right now peak Japan. And I think that despite all the ambitions and all of the energies devoted by Prime Minister Abe to raising Japanese political profile regionally and internationally, my belief for a variety of structural factors is that this is not a sustainable position. And I'm prepared to talk about it. I'm not sure this is the venue for it. But the, nevertheless, there are, I think, political and strategic consequences that follow from that. The one that's most important to me and the one that comes out in some other research I've done on a book that hopefully will be published sometime soon, is that Japan needs to really rethink its relationship with Asia. And that, in, in my mind, what that means is revisiting the decision that was made in the Meiji Restoration of what's called Datsua, to go out of Asia. And thus, for a whole variety of social, political, and economic reasons, the relationship needs to be recast and reconfigured. Now, it does not mean, I'm not suggesting a zero-sum kind of uh, formula in which its relationship with Asia comes at the expense of the alliance with the United States. So there's some, there's some fine wine lines to be walked here. But nevertheless, there needs to be a fundamental reassessment of the way that Japan deals in particular with Northeast Asia, Seoul and, and Beijing. Um, because in many ways, the failure to do so will, I think, really marginalize Japan, weaken it, and make it very vulnerable in the future. Um, this logic, mind you, is um, not terribly welcome in some cases in, in uh, Tokyo right now. Um, but nevertheless, the difficulties of engaging China are profound, and that has to be part of it. It is, quite frankly, I think, an easier uh, uh, pick and, and, and task to, to begin this process with Seoul. And there's far more, I think, an easier way to gain traction, an easier, there's far more that they can do. And it will pay, I think, larger dividends over time. That are, uh, that, and uh, I'll, I'll just stop with that. So there's that. Similarly, my sense is, is that Seoul has got to look at, as it looks over the horizon, it needs to, I think, reassess its longer term relationship with Japan. Number one, if we go back to the Japanese piece of this, if the Japanese make the deal, for example, with Beijing first, if that reconciliation is completed, which must be done eventually, Seoul is extremely marginalized in that, in my mind, in that scenario, that it becomes an even weaker and more diminished player, that it really needs to, I think, in my mind, work more with Japan now to preempt it being really, really shunted aside in the future. I think the urgency of that particular task becomes greater when we look at the way that the, 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 the situation on the Korean Peninsula is evolving. Even if there is, by some strange miracle, unification, that the, the energies in Seoul will be increasingly focused on the North. If North Korea continues to exist and you have increasingly combative and an increasingly destabilizing uh, uh, government in Pyongyang, then Seoul's energies, I think, will become increasingly constricted. The volatility that we see on the peninsula today, that we've, I think that we, you know, the, the way that the United States has been hyping or playing up the threat uh, over the last couple of weeks, while not, that language doesn't mean to diminish it, but nevertheless, it suggests to me that this is going to be an increasing concern of the world and thus a, 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 a genuine, it's going to force Seoul, I think, as well, to focus its attentions more closely. And that's, the good scenario if things don't go to hell in a handbasket. If there is a genuine crisis on the peninsula, and if, for example, I think there is uh, something that leads us to unification, even in those circumstances, my sense is, is that Seoul will be even increasingly preoccupied with peninsular affairs and will be, I think, pulling back from engagement in many other parts of the world. In that particular situation, there is, I think, greater possibility for China to extend its influence into the Korean Peninsula as well. If that is, in fact, the case, then you need to have, I think, Seoul needs as many external balancers as possible. Japan becomes, in many senses, the best partner for that. So if you combine that logic with the logic that I have about Japan's case, then what you really have is a powerful, powerful reason for South Korea and Japan to be, I think, getting ahead, if you will, of these kind of strategic uh, wedges and trying to forge some kind of relationship um, that Give, I think that, that maximizes both potential in the future in, in Northeast Asia. I hope that was clear. Um, at this moment, I will, um, 
I'll stop. I will beg being jet lagged, tired, and sleepless for any incoherence. And I'll let Scott demonstrate to you all why I've been carrying him for the last couple of years <laughs> is through this entire project. Thanks for your patience and thanks for your, your tolerance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I walked in here today, uh, I actually joked uh, to Brad and Kyle that um, Brad's selection of me as a discussant for his presentation was a profile in timidity uh, as a co-author of the book that uh, uh, in part he's uh, been talking about. But Kyle obviously knew better. Somehow he knew that it took us eight years to produce this uh, book. And so uh, clearly there are differences uh, that had to be bridged uh, in our um, uh, respective uh, views. And I guess that stands to reason since we also were doing uh, research on identity related issues between Japan and South Korea and kind of digging in uh, to the ways in which identity has been an obstacle uh, in the development of that relationship. Um, so the first area where I um, am going to disagree with Brad is uh, really on uh, how right did we get it. Uh, and essentially what I would say is that uh, uh, the book was only partially affirmed by subsequent events because the leaders only partially took our advice. Um, you know, we actually advocated a kind of grand bargain, um, and, and Brad mentioned, um, uh, in addition to the comfort woman issue, we suggested a whole series of other measures uh, that Japan and South Korea could take with each other in order to truly uh, bridge the gap uh, in the relationship, including removal of the um, uh, island dispute uh, as uh, an issue of contention uh, in Japan-South Korea relations, essentially the establishment of a friendship treaty, uh, pledges uh, of support for a unified Korea under Seoul's leadership, um, and um, uh, pledges of non-aggression uh, toward each other. Uh, so I think that the Comfort Woman Agreement was really just a small part of everything that we proposed. Uh, what we were really calling for was statesmanship uh, to lead a comprehensive approach on both sides. And I think the core of our thinking on that was that statesmanship was required as much to come to an agreement with each other uh, as to change the identity formulation that had existed uh, in each country toward the other uh, for such a long time. And essentially what that meant is that we were encouraging the leaders to uh, elevate the value of the uh, relationship between Japan and South Korea and essentially bring the other into the, into the tent on both sides and kind of consider the concerns of the other as part of really the, um, the, the, the thread of domestic formulation in terms of thinking about politics. Um, and I would say that that's actually where um, we see a lot of problems, especially related to uh, the situation the Comfort Women Agreement finds itself in now, uh, because in fact, uh, I think that where the agreement is really breaking down has been uh, in the context of a political leadership vacuum uh, in Seoul. Uh, we see a, um, an event uh, in South Korea related to Japan uh, that satisfies domestic constituencies and elevates um, Japan as an issue in domestic politics over the importance of the bilateral cooperation in the placement of the Comfort Woman statue near the Japanese consulate. And so I thought it was very interesting uh, shortly after the initial placement that actually the foreign ministry made a plea to remove uh, the uh, statue. And in fact, it was removed, I think, for about 48 hours. Uh, and then in the absence of real political leadership uh, from the central government in Seoul uh, and in the face of opposition from domestic constituencies in Busan, uh, there was a reversal uh, and we saw the Comfort Women statue come back uh, into place. Um, and so I think that it really underscores uh, the fact that if we're going to see a fundamental change in the relationship between Japan and South Korea um, going forward, once again, it's really going to require uh, statesmanship 
uh, between the two leaders. And actually, in some respects, I would argue that it's going to be even more difficult to move forward and repair some of the um, uh, problems, at least in the initial stage, uh, under a, a new uh, South Korean leadership. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute, but I just want to go back and also review a couple of stats. Um, I don't have any recent polls. Uh, a, a lot of our uh, book really focused on um, public opinion as a way of getting at uh, the question of identity, uh, especially in terms of perceptions of self and other. Uh, and so I always like to go back and, and look at polls uh, on key issues and kind of follow the uh, polling to see how it stacks up uh, with our argument. Uh, and last year, uh, in summer of 2016, uh, we were at a point where both sides um, uh, saw uh, improvement over the previous year uh, in, um, uh, uh, in their uh, impressions of uh, the other side. Uh, it was still largely negative in Japan and South Korea, but there was slight improvement. Uh, on both sides. I would argue that uh, if the survey were taken uh, last month and we were looking at the results today, that we probably have lost the ground uh, that had been gained uh, last year uh, as a result of uh, the um, issues that have come up and really the kind of paralysis in the Japan-South Korea relationship uh, over the first part of 2017. Um, secondly, last summer, um, the polls showed actually that South Koreans, a plurality, remained dissatisfied with the Comfort One Agreement. Um, and so in a way, this is an obvious point of vulnerability that I think became even more vulnerable as a result of uh, the impeachment of President Park because when you dig down and look at uh, the levels of support uh, for the Comfort Woman Agreement uh, in South Korea, interestingly enough, what it showed uh, is that support uh, pretty much broke down along generational lines that paralleled uh, the level of Park's support uh, in uh, South Korea, her domestic support rate. So in other words, uh, there was stronger support for the Comfort Woman Agreement among older generation Koreans who also were supporters of Park. Uh, compared to uh, younger generation Koreans who did not support Park, who uh, opposed the agreement. And so in, in that respect, it's actually no wonder that we find uh, in the course of uh, her spectacular collapse and the change in mood in South Korea that this agreement might also be vulnerable. Uh, and I think that's exactly, in fact, uh, what we're uh, seeing. And then thirdly, and I'm going to come back to this, um, uh, the polling from last summer showed that only 16 percent of South Koreans associate uh, U.S. security ties with attempts to check China's influence, while in Japan, 30 percent of Japanese associate U.S. security ties with attempts to check China's influence. Uh, and this kind of gets at one of the themes that I think Brad was trying to develop, um, you know, the question of, you know, if Japan really wants South Korea uh, on its side as it thinks about uh, the future of um, relations with China, well, that particular component of the trilateral relationship is uh, quite weak and probably not going to be substantiable uh, because of the differing views that uh, exist uh, in South Korea related to China, even in the context of the economic retaliation. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit more. Um, so bottom line, what are we looking at? We've got an election in South Korea in 12 days. Uh, there have been a few underwhelming debates uh, on South Korean TV uh, over various issues. But one issue that really has not gotten extensive time uh, in those debates uh, is the issue of South Korea-Japan relations. Why? Well, because almost everybody in South Korea agrees <laughs> about uh, relations with Japan uh, and the con uh, point of convergence on agreement is not a positive one. Uh, and that is that, in fact, um, the two leading candidates, I think, in various forms, um, want to review the Comfort One Agreement. Uh, uh, the way that it's stated, I think, in the Moon Jae-in campaign platform is that they want a principled approach to history. Uh, which basically raises the prospect that um, uh, it's highly likely 
that a new um, administration in Korea, uh, frankly, regardless of uh, who wins, may begin by trying to uh, reopen uh, the Comfort Woman Agreement. I think Brad already indicated that in, in Japan that's really considered almost a, a settled issue. Uh, and so I think that what that means is that in the initial phase uh, of next year, we're going to see um, uh, a kind of stalemate continuing in the South Korea-Japan relationship uh, with this uh, issue of how to view uh, the recently established and partially implemented agreement as, the, as a significant uh, impediment. Um, and so um, I'm not very optimistic uh, in the near term about um, uh, moving forward uh, with a stable Japan-South uh, Korea relationship. I, I agree that uh, U.S. attempts to promote trilateralism have been uh, important, uh, and we see a lot of those continuing uh, at a bureaucratic level. Uh, what I think we don't know is whether there is going to be uh, a commitment to trilateralism at higher levels uh, in the current uh, administration. So we'll have to wait and see uh, how that plays out. And then um, the other issue related to trilateralism, I think, is that uh, traditionally we've seen that um, the support for trilateralism among the U.S., Japan, South Korea has actually been weakest under South Korean progressive leaders. Uh, in other words, to go back early 2000s uh, when we had uh, progressive leaders in place in South Korea and relatively greater alignment uh, between the Bush administration and the Japanese government uh, over how they viewed North Korea, uh, we saw a breakdown uh, in uh, uh, the previously existing bureaucratic formulation, the Trilateral Coordination and Oversight Group uh, that had existed from the late 1990s. Uh, and so I worry uh, that uh, South Korean progressive perceptions of a U.S. that may, from their perspective, be too closely aligned with Japan could actually become an inhibiting factor that could interfere with some of the um, trilateral cooperation that has gone forward. Some of it will be protected by institutionalization, but I do think that uh, it may come under challenge. The good news, as always, is that uh, progressive administration, there's already a new acronym I discovered in doing research for this talk uh, related to Korean um, uh, prospects for regionalism. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. If it's uh, Moon, uh, they have the uh, what they call the Northeast Asia Plus um, uh, Group for Common Responsibility uh, in a... N-E-A-P-C-R is what that will end up looking like, I think. Um, not pretty. Um, and essentially, it's a continuation of the uh, Korean commitment to try to promote uh, regionalism uh, in Northeast Asia. And actually, that, in a way, ends up being uh, the traditional backdoor to trying to restore some kind of stability to Japan-South Korea relations, uh, in my view. Uh, because you have to have a minimal level of effective diplomatic communication in order for, as a prerequisite for being able to build uh, regionalism. Uh, and so actually, I, that's, I think I'll just uh, make one other point, uh, and that is that uh, bilateral communication, I think, uh, in the first part of the year uh, has been problematic in contrast to the US. And I just think it's interesting to note, uh, Brad mentioned no con uh, conversation between acting president uh, in South Korea uh, and the ambassador. But this has gone on while President Trump has had at least three conversations with South Korea's acting president. Uh, and so you have the same kind of communication gap, uh, I think, uh, existing now that actually fed some of Japan's um, perceptions a few years ago that South Korea was drifting off uh, into China's camp. Uh, even at the same time that there really wasn't a sufficient justification for those anxieties. Um, and the reason why there was not a sufficient justification for those, for those anxieties was precisely that there was strong communication between Washington and Seoul uh, during that period. I'll stop there. Brad, do you want to respond? To Absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, Scott's right insofar as, you know, yes, we didn't get it all right. They haven't done everything we asked them to do yet. Okay, let's go on to questions then. <laughs> yeah. But, but 
I think, you, nevertheless, again, the, you know, the underlying thesis about all this, 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 this salience of identity. I'm not giving up on this one, pal. Um, that one we, we've still got. And I think that, you know, it, it, whether there's a solution to this or not, and, you know, I think the irony of this really, quite frankly, will be, weirdly enough, it would have to be the Abe Moon, to the degree that there's a deal to be struck, one that would endure, it would be between those two. I mean, part, frankly, reconciliation with her would always be subject to challenge by the progressives in South Korea. You know, so if Abe can bring the Japanese conservatives with him, he needs a counterpart who really, I think, has to deliver the liberal left in South Korea, and that really requires a progressive candidate. So if you want the prerequisite to an enduring agreement, and I'm not giving up on this one yet, pal, um, then I think it's got to be Abe and Moon, or a left candidate in Seoul rather than a conservative. Um, and I guess, I, you know, as always, Scott's like going to try to confuse you with facts and things. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I think I'll just stop right now. And, and having re broadly reasserted um, my primacy, I'll you think we'll take go ahead questions. With your alternative thought. That's right. We'll go ahead with. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sticking away from facts. We'll I, go with Q&A. I'm going to ask one question before we before we head off into the audience. Um, I had in a recent article you had written, um, you had referred to Japan talking to you, Brad. Um, you know, Japan had to think strategically, not in terms of guns and butter, but of guns and wheelchairs. And right. Demographic changes are something that's really going to be very important to Korea and Japan, and both how they view each other in, in their identities. And Scott, you talked a little bit about this in your remarks, too, between the younger and older generations. How do you feel as these uh, countries begin to go through these demographic changes, um, these identity issues will uh, come up in the future? Um, I mean, I haven't really, I mean, Scott's suggestions regarding the, um, the, uh, uh, the generational divide, for example, on park support would, I think, probably suggest, it, it, the question becomes, is that a generational, that generation specific, or is that more tied to just aging in general? You know, the famous, if you're not a, a communist when you're 20, you're, you've got no uh, uh, heart. If you're still a communist when you're 30 or a socialist, you've got no head. Um, I think... If that generational progression continues, then obviously um, you will see uh, a convergence over time. Um, you know, it certainly would, I would think, diminish. And th this is, you know, that is the structural uh, predicate for my peak Japan argument. You know, and by the way, the numbers suggest that I think by 20, Japan will run out of people like 500 years after South Korea. So if they can wait them out, they can prevail in this one. <laughs> Something, if you do the numbers, like by 2,500, South Korea has one person left, and by 3,000, I think Japan is gone. So, you know, they're, they're holding out for that. But, I mean, the larger issue just becomes the degree to which, of course, Japan becomes less of, a, 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 of an enemy. And so, and, and to my mind, that means that the Japanese, their capacity to um, deliver on larger foreign policy agenda, et cetera, uh, means that it's what drives Japan, I think, to, to reconcile now. But I think, by that logic, yes, it should undercut any threat uh, and imagery uh, for, among South Koreans as they look at Japan. But that presumes, again, that they're focusing really on, on the factual predicates and, and not just a perceived bias. OK. Uh, in the question up front? Yes, Rob. Well, excuse me. Can you wait for the oh, my Good. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for your presentations. I uh, would like to ask you to elaborate on two points that came up. The, the first one is uh, both of you mentioned a perceived drift of South Korea towards China. Would you elaborate on that? Is it primarily over the FAD missile issue, or is it much deeper? And, and how do you see that uh, coming out and at the results of the election coming up? And the second question is, uh, how is it that we had the Abe-Trump summit and there was no mention of South Korea in the communique or by the leaders? Uh, I'll start with that and I'll let you think for a minute. Once again, I'm providing cover for Scott. Um, you know, no, the, um, the issues on the drift of South Korea well predate that. You know, it was the sense that uh, President Park was accommodating China, that, you know, she was meeting with Xi Jinping, she spoke Chinese, she wasn't meeting consequently with Abe. Um, for those of us, though, that had been concerned about that, uh, there was, we had been reassured, quite frankly, five years ago, before she came to office, we met with, with some people that would subsequently assume very senior positions in our government. And we were told, 
that the logic in Seoul is that the road to Pyongyang goes through Beijing. So we will have to have a close relationship with Beijing. But that does not mean that we are in any ways drifting away. And I thought, to my mind, the conversations that I saw working in, in both, you know, between Washington and Seoul at the working levels on security issues, et cetera, uh, I think undercut the concern in Japan and among, frankly, people here that you were seeing South Korea shift in its larger strategic alignment. Um, and so we've been battling against that uh, in varying uh, degrees pretty much since that all became, people started to, 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 to take that more seriously, I think, than it deserved. Um, in regard to the Abe uh, Trump summit, I mean, I would say that be, because that wasn't a real summit, I mean, in the sense that the way that it was rushed through, the way that it was essentially an attempt, I think, to um, change for, for Japan. Is this being taped, right? Um, um, <laughs> we're on the record here. Um, no. I, Tokyo has been, I think, extraordinarily shrewd in shaping the way that the U.S. and the, or the Trump administration and the president sees Japan. One of the constants in the Donald Trump uh, uh, think, uh, mindset since the 1980s has been this vision of Japan as an economic, uh, lack of a better word, enemy, adversary. It's probably closer. And so I think that the Japanese were rightfully concerned about the direction of the relationship. And so they have been extremely quick and I think very shrewd to do their best to shape the relationship in ways that would be seen as beneficial. And I think you've seen this massaging, some would, might call it manipulation. I would think it's just very good foreign policy management on the part of the Abe government. Uh, and, and you've seen this in the, in, in, in the way that the, the Pence visit unfolded. And so I think that you, know, you didn't have the staffing available that would have run through the standard statement that made sure all of the diplomatic boilerplate would have been checked off. I think that, that in, in that way, the Japanese got what they really wanted, which was a focus on the bilateral relationship, not to the exclusion of these other issues, but just because that's what really mattered to them. And that they got, that was what for them was, was really the priority in making sure that, the, that those boxes got, check, got ticked to start. I'll just make um, a couple of observations. One is, um, you know, in a, in a way, the test for Brad's hypothesis with regard to, you know, how the Japanese, or the, the, the test of the hypothesis of how Japan is looking at South Korea vis-a-vis -vis China uh, is uh, better tested by the current environment as a result of the economic retaliation against that uh, than it was tested by what existed before. Before, what I used to say is that in Japan, um, uh, Japan had kind of two-dimensional diplomacy when uh, it looked at uh, Seoul because Seoul was a point on a line between Tokyo and Beijing and the closer that you got to China it meant that you had to be moving away from Tokyo. But now we've got a situation where uh, South Korean public opinion toward China has moved something like 20 to 30 points. It's shifted from positive to negative uh, and yet uh, especially under a progressive government you know, my prediction is that uh, Japan's thesis of trying to uh, enlist South Korea as a partner in containing China is also not going to gain support in South Korea. There's still going to be obstacles there. Uh, in a way, South Korea, I think, uh, is essentially hemmed in by history. Uh, and um, its primary and really only viable play still uh, as I argue in a book that's coming out in September, actually, uh, is that um, it has to align with the United States. It has to maintain the alliance uh, with the U.S. Uh, that's the strategic logic from basically the late 19th century onward for South Korea strategically. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I think Brad's already answered the other question. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I just want to add, uh, is I'm, I'm not sure about the degree to which Tokyo looks at Seoul as a partner to contain China yet. I mean, I think there's a, slight, there's a somewhat more realistic assessment in Seoul, or in, in Tokyo, certainly regarding security issues, which is, is that you are not going to see uh, the South Koreans line up with the United States and Japan against South Korea, against China yet. Um, I think there is a sense that, that, however, that they see a broader alignment of, in, 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 you know, larger questions of, of values, rights, et cetera, 
international obligations, but uh, I, I, I don't think the Japanese are that naive yet, or, 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 or that uh, demanding, if you will, of South Korea on that particular principle. And I'm just curious, if, is, is it my thesis that, that, that South Korea wasn't swinging, or our thesis that South Korea wasn't swinging? Was it what? Swinging? Uh, it, uh, that wasn't swinging towards China. Was I the one that was making that case, or just us? No, I think it was the, the Japanese. Right, okay. Making the case. Anyway, all right. Uh, Larry Nix, I would like to bring uh, into the discussion uh, the impact of Japanese defense policy uh, in this uh, relationship. Amidst all of the very good reporting in the Washington Post on the North Korean issue, over the last three weeks, uh, Anna Fifield's article got lost, her article about the debate in Japan heightened by the North Korean issue over developing or beginning to develop in Jap Japan's military arsenal long-range strike military capabilities. Japan already is going to be purchasing F-35s from the U.S. There is a debate in Japan heightened that she pointed out over acquiring Tomahawk cruise missiles which again would give Japan a much longer range strike capability, presumably to be used against North Korea. Now, back in 2014, when President Abe, when the Japanese were debating President Abe's proposal for a new collective self-defense, defense policy, there was a a lot of criticism that I saw coming out of South Korea about Japan moving in this direction. But when the policy was finalized and it became apparent that the Obama administration was going to support it 100 percent, President Park definitely backed down, backed off from the criticism of Japan. But with the debate now seemingly moving into a new stage of potential expansion of Japanese defense policy and military capabilities, I have three questions related to what the South Korean reaction is likely to be to this if it moves ahead uh, in Japan with regard to acquiring long-range strike capabilities. First, have any of the presidential candidates discussed this? Secondly, if Japan moves in this direction in a substantive way, can you see a possibility that South Korean public opinion and perhaps governmental policy will begin to view Japan as a second military threat just behind North Korea. And thirdly, if Japan does move in this direction, could this give China some opportunities to solidify the relationship with South Korea based on a, a kind of Japanese, anti-Japanese uh, military entente or Chinese military guarantees offered to South Korea. Do you want to handle the president, the, the, the own politics, and I'll take the broader okay. debate stuff? Yeah, I actually um, have, have not seen um, discussion by the candidates of, of that particular issue. I might have missed it. Uh, but I do think that um, there's been discussion in some of the newspapers, primarily Hangyure, about this. Uh, and uh, they're expressing sensitivities that I think primarily would probably be on the progressive side um, uh, with regard to the prospect of Japanese um, more active military profile. Uh, this issue of a strike capability is one that hits a nerve, I think, uh, among South Korean um, specialists. Uh, I saw it play out a couple of years ago in a private dialogue uh, here in town. 
so it definitely hits a nerve. Uh, and uh, back during the Noh Hyun administration, um, in fact, what we saw was a South Korea that um, did express uh, a lot of concerns about uh, Japan as a potential threat. Uh, and that was a source of tension between um, Washington uh, and Seoul at that time. Uh, and so it stands to reason that it's possible to imagine that that could reemerge as an issue uh, in a government that is staffed by some of the same people um, uh, in Seoul uh, that were in place at that time. Um, all right. The, the, most of the opinion surveys already seem to show that the Japanese are considered a military threat by a substantial number of South Koreans already. If you ask them to rank them, Japan tends to be number two, memory serves, um, in, in a number of these polls, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, number two, uh, the, uh, you know, part of this, this debate has been going on for a while. The first time the Japanese took up seriously this, the discussion of strike or preemptive options was around 2006. And uh, I thought it then was a, was a, a not a particularly smart move, and I, st I make the same case now. Um, number one, it's not smart because I think, as, we, as you mentioned earlier regarding the demogra demographic challenges, strike to be effective requires an extraordinary investments in terms of not only just having the, the, the weapons to hit, but you need to have the, I, the ISR capabilities, you've got to have real-time processing, you've got to have training, you've got to have doctrine, you've got to have a lot of stuff that none of which the Japanese have. The Japanese have also, at the same time, a limit of 1% defense spending of GDP, which is not carved in stone, but nevertheless is generally tended to be, on it, to be honored. We've seen some increases in uh, the defense budget, but I think as a result of uh, a number of, con of constraints, um, what you're going to see is increasingly straightened choices among the Japanese to address uh, the, the defense buildup that they're anticipating anyway, or the shifts in defense. Strike would be a real budget buster. And I am unconvinced that it is the most efficient use of those limited dollars. I've made that case in Tokyo. I've been making it for, for a while. I mean, I, that's what I told Anna when she wrote the article, actually. Um, so I don't see necessarily the Japanese are um, will, will, it's, it's, it's good to talk about, but I'm not sure they're going to pursue it, because I don't think they quite understand the totality of the investments that are involved. Third, in many ways, what strike, I think, demonstrates the, the, the issue of concern should not be in Seoul, it should be in Washington. Because what it is suggesting is, is that the Japanese don't trust us to act in their behalf in the event that there is a contingency that they, the Japanese believe that a nuclear weapon in North Korea is targeted at them, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks. They believe that if North Korea is going to hit anybody, it's going to be Japan. Um, and I think there's probably some truth to that logic. The concern then is that the United States will not act in a way that would protect Japan. And so thus, they want their own finger on the trigger because they don't think we're going to do it. So that is in some ways a expression of uh, lack of faith in decision making in Washington. Well, I was going to get to that in a second. That was the last point. Uh, the, Jap the, the South Korean case is undercut to some degree by the extensions on the missile limits that were set, that were readjusted, what, four or five years ago? Uh, when the South Koreans were given the agreement with the United States to extend their capabilities to farther up north reaches up in North Korea, which some of the Japanese at the time pointed out also put per certain parts of Japan within range as well. So, I mean, there's a reciprocal uh, concern that cuts both ways. I just don't think that the Japanese are, are, going to, are going to look at this and decide it's the best use of limited defense dollars. And the potentially destabilizing effects are quite severe. I see them having absolutely no effect insofar as uh, China would go because uh, if the Japanese will never acquire enough capabilities to, to do anything more than just irritate China. So it's got to be a North Korea target set. Uh, one, and one final point. We've run tabletop exercises with Japanese security people as well. And the, the, the truth is that the Japanese have, at this moment, absolutely no capacity to strike North Korea to retaliate for any action that is taken against Japan. And it is a quite eye-opening uh, I mean, of course, they could send suicide, I suppose, you know, kamikaze planes or something, but they really do not have the capabilities to punish North Korea for actions taken against Japan militarily. Um, and so that is a very vexing position for them. And it's not one of which they're very happy about, particularly when you've got a belligerent, you know, government in Pyongyang and one that is expected to be using uh, Japan in many ways as its preferred target. So. Daniel? 
Thank you both very much for your comments. Uh, my name is Mike Bacalo. Uh My question relates to the campaign. As you both mentioned, uh, there's not really much space between the candidates with regards to the Comfort Women Agreement. But I'm wondering if there are major differences of opinion between the candidates on their position and outlook towards China, especially given reflection on the experience of the Park Administration over the last couple of years. Yeah, I, so the main, I think, manifestation of that particular discussion in the Korean presidential campaign has really revolved around uh, the THAAD deployment issue. And um, there, I, I think it's kind of a complicated picture on the progressive side because um, Ahn initially opposed THAAD, but he's come around to supporting it. Uh, Moon has um, uh, kind of uh, adjusted his position gradually, but focused primarily uh, his criticisms primarily on process uh, and on the question of whether or not the Park Administration should have tried to have better communication with China uh, in the course of establishing the implementation. Uh, and so I think that reflects the fact that Moon is um, slightly m more, um, I guess, supportive of the idea of trying to improve relations with China as a vehicle by which to um, address some of the, uh, to, 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 to uh, secure a, a more stable inter-Korean relationship uh, on, um, in some ways, it's, it's uh, really procedural differences. Um, you know, Ahn advocates a return to four-party talks and six-party talks, uh, and therefore, uh, by implication, wants to have a, um, a more active communication with China. Uh, but uh, in terms of his overall orientation, is probably a little bit more security-focused. He's got a very strong emphasis on building up defense uh, that has come out of as part of his campaign and actually is targeting a 3% of GDP military spending. Uh, which is uh, probably one of the major distinguishing points, I think, on the foreign affairs and national security side uh, compared to Moon. Uh, I'm uh, Kyung Jin Bak from Korean Embassy, but uh, uh, I'm not telling you the here the, uh, the not going to tell you that I'm the government of opinion. This is my just personal opinion. Uh, first, uh, that the uh, I know that there was some um, uh, there was atmosphere at Japan and, and here in U.S. Uh, that uh, in the power administration administration is a little bit tilted to toward uh, China. However, Korea has been always the uh, the keeping and the, the maintaining and strengthening the the uh, good relationship with uh, um, the U.S. It was always been a priority for us. Based on that, uh, Korea was also trying to use, uh, trying to make up more every efforts uh, maintaining the bilateral relations with China and with, with also, uh, Japan also. And uh, the second one is the Korea-Japan uh, relations. Um, uh, I, uh, I, don't, I think I don't need to hear re it, uh, repeat the, the Korean government uh, op opinion. Uh, uh, government stands on the comfort women issue and the, the Busan uh, comfort women state issue uh, so, but um, and there was so so much so much uh, detailed com uh, discussion here that we I really appreciate that but however I'm just gonna uh, mention that uh, maybe everyone in, in the in 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 the in this room that I'm not so sure we are aware of the, 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 in the Japan situation. Uh, Japan still, uh, recently also Jap some Japanese congressmen is, 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 uh, um, is uh, public, pu publicly uh, mentioning that uh, kind of the reckless and thoughtless words on comfort women. And it has been always uh, the, uh, posing a negative impact to Korea-Japan relations as well as the sentiment of the Korea, Korean um, people. So. I hope we all the, uh, we uh, the, the understand that point also. The, so we are thinking that the Japanese side, uh, before they uh, they have some kind of the uh, um, complaint or concern of the uh, whether or not we are going to uh, continue our the, that agreement, 
before that, they need to, they need to the, be cautious about their uh, mention about the, the sensitive issue. I would just comment. I mean, it's true that there are some um, assembly people and parliamentarians in Japan that that uh, are quick for, to shoot from the hip. One of the things, though, that has impressed me about Abe and the deal is, is that he has enforced what seems to me a zero tolerance policy from his cabinet on, on regarding it. When people spoke out once or twice or seemed to come close, he shut them down pretty quickly. And that, that impressed to me, impressed upon me, I think, a commitment on his part to honoring within you know, the constitutional limits that he has regarding freedom of speech and certainly uh, within his own government. So. Your, your point's taken, but I also think this, too, is a moment in which Japan deserves and, and Prime Minister Abe deserves some credit as well. Yeah, Paul Tyson from the State Department. I was just curious as to reactions that you might have had from your contacts on both President Trump and Vice President Pence. And do you see Pence and his people being more of the point people in the relationships with Northeast Asia going forward? Um, in the absence of anybody else, yeah, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. I think that you know they they look they're looking at Tillerson, they're looking at Mattis, they're looking at at uh, uh, the vice president is providing the stability, the the vision, such as you have one, and of course the great as you know, I mean uh, the working level stuff is going on. There are meetings. I mean, there's a Korean military delegation here today, the Jap I know that the folks that work with Japan on these issues, it's both state and, and, and DOD are, are regularly engaged. So, I mean, US foreign policy right now is, is a, an intriguing study. I mean, it will provide fascinating case studies for academicians, I think, for in years to come. But we're, uh, it's, it's a work in progress. How does it feel in the belly of the beast? <laughs> um, I think the questions are just one way here. One way. <laughs> So, Brad, Scott, um, you both sort of laid out a potential future to where, you know, a new government in South Korea takes and tries to renegotiate or perhaps worst case scenario repudiates the government woman agreement. The situation in Japan to where even if Abe wants to, maybe he can't bring people along for a second bite at the apple. Um, if we get to this situation, is there the capacity or the ability of the U.S. now as opposed to during the five years of the Park Administration where this issue really kind of came to a head to sort of try and walk everyone back and get everybody back to the table or is this something to where we won't be able to and it could become worse? Um, why are you looking at me? Um, I want to see where so you're going to answer this and then I'll... Well, you know, maybe another way, I'll, I'll just relate a story, a uh, kind of anecdote. Uh, and I, th I think it's pretty clear that over the course of the past few years, we have um, had a situation where uh, the United States provided uh, pretty strong support for trilateralism, uh, building it institutionally and also really leading it, uh, including with the deputy secretary level uh, trilateral dialogue on a quarterly basis, which is a pretty big commitment. Um, back during the campaign, uh, I was talking with a senior South Korean former diplomat who also has close ties with Japan, uh, and he was telling me about a recent visit that he had taken to Tokyo where um, he had talked uh, about the prospects of a Trump victory. And essentially, he said uh, that he and his Japanese colleague agreed that uh, if Trump won, that they would also have a lot of motive to uh, cooperate very actively uh, in, the pro uh, in the context of the prospect of uh, the lack of a U.S. kind of guiding uh, hand or promotion of trilateralism. Uh, so I don't know. I think that that indirectly provides some picture of the fact that uh, to one degree or another, Japan and South Korea you know, have shared interests that tie themselves to each other, whether they like it or not. You know, that was always Victor's thesis, right? In, in, in his classic book, um, Alliance Without Antag despite Antagonism, right? Uh, was always that when the United States 
started to withdraw that that puts Seoul and Tokyo closer together. And if you talk to Victor, at least the last time I explicitly asked him about this, you know, his argument was that times have changed and that's not necessarily true anymore. And I'm not, Scott, suggesting that it may still be. Um, but by the same token, I would go back to where Scott started his remarks, which is our book, is all about leadership, I mean, at the end of the day, and the degree to which the leaders of these countries acknowledge that they need to be statesmen, statespeople, whatever the word is, um, and really change the narrative and make a genuine attempt to do so. And in doing that, you know, it's a choice that they get to make between being historical leaders, great historical leaders, or, or national leaders, if you will, versus being historically recognized leaders. And that was, that was the way that we framed it. You can, you know, Abe, I think, is going to go down in history at this point, barring some really crazy catastrophe, will go down as a very, I mean, he's already the sixth, the fifth largest serving, longest serving prime minister in Japan, Japanese history. That's pretty impressive. Um, and he has... You know, he's done some very, very impressive things, but they are within the scale of Japan being during that, that term of office. If he wants to be a world historical narrative changing figure, then he's got to change this identity piece. He's got to have partners to do that, however. And then the question becomes is will that interest be re reciprocated in Seoul? Um, I do not sense, I mean, at the end of the day, what we're addressing here are somewhat moral issues. And again, I, I, well, um, I don't see that as being a necessarily a driver of the administration in this country. I think you know, the, the notion of make America great, great again and America first is not premised on any particularly profound moral principles. So the degree then to which the United States becomes a driver of that reconciliation or you know, creating, if you will, even a slipstream for the leaders of Tokyo, Seoul, or any other country to fill in that particular blank uh, I, I don't, I'm not seeing that. So then the question becomes, can Abe provide the energy by himself? Will he find a partner? And then the only other problem, mind you, that comes with that, even if they choose not to, and to wait to see how things play out, is sort of a, a sadly a truncated version of the demographic issue we talked about earlier, and that is the comfort women are dying. If that does not get settled in a meaningful way before the last one's gone, Japan, the door closes forever. And with that happy note. Ah, oh, there's still more questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, Scott Seaman with Eurasia Group. Um, you mentioned, for example, the currency swap. Um, I think you also mentioned the trilateral trade agreement that China, South Korea, and Japan are working on. but. Could you comment a little bit more on how the economic relationship could help strengthen the security relationship, for example, between Japan and Korea, to the extent it, it does? You know, it, it, the Japanese and the South Koreans see each other increasingly as competitors. I mean, you know, the Japanese, the South Koreans have always looked to Japan, you know, and, and just as the, American, the Japanese looked at the Americans as those the standards they set. And I think that the Japanese in many ways look at, or the South Koreans look at Japanese companies now and don't see them necessarily in front of them, either aside them and in some cases behind them in the rear view mirror. Um, so is there's the competitive element to the relationship. You're seeing an increasing number, and Scott I know follows this far more closely than I do, increasing numbers of investments I think where you're seeing Japanese and South Korean companies working, forming joint ventures in ways that um, I think are helpful and I think you know, the, the, the interesting question for this, which is plotting, taking, uh, plotting certain trajectories, is the degree to which the, um, the Japanese are prepared to anticipate uh, their future, so, you know, their society, their economy, et cetera, and really begin to um, uh, shape choices now, or make choices now that shape the future in ways I think that deepen its integration, for example, with Asia, as part of my, my, my concluding remarks. I mean, one intriguing component of this, which is a, sort of on the economic dimension, is the talk of building a Northeast Asian energy grid. And, you know, there's all this discussion, for example, of using Mongolia. Masayoshi Son has been pushing a lot of this stuff, of building huge uh, renewable energy farms in Mongolia and then creating transmission belts that would take that energy all across Northeast Asia. And ideally that you link it in ways such that you can use the energy flows. Both, uh, all those countries can be both suppliers and 
and, and producers or suppliers and consumers of, of various energy uh, uh, resources. And mind you, this is an extraordinarily ambitious agenda, but it's one that I think is quite intriguing. And we, I think, in the United States do not pay sufficient attention to the structural integration of Northeast Asia and all of East Asia through, whether it's through APEC, through the ASEAN plus three process, the plus three, plus three process, or even the private sector dimensions of that in ways that I think will transform Asia and then transform the U.S. relationship with Asia over you know, a period of time measured in decades. Uh, the only additional comment I'd add is that, uh, especially in the context of the lingering comfort woman issues as an obstacle to the relationship between Japan and South Korea under the early part of the Park administration, uh, I got the impression that Korean business leaders were really tired of that issue. Uh, and they just wanted to get on with doing their, they, they didn't really, they regarded it as a sideshow and as a drag. Uh, and so um, I think that increasingly the economic dynamics of these relationships between Japan and South Korea have been kind of divorced from uh, the political government to government relationships um, and driven more by uh, sectoral needs and concerns. And there it really is um, kind of complicated because Japan and South Korea on the one hand in certain sectors are competitors, but you can also make a very good argu argument uh, that they are complementary markets uh, to each other, uh, where um, Japanese and South Korean uh, companies have an interest in trying to capture market share, uh, regardless of borders, to the extent possible. We have what, time for one last question. Uh, yes, uh, Dave Fitzgerald, retired Foreign Service. A couple of questions. Uh, when you're talking about national identity, you're not really addressing the question of uh, which Korea is going to emerge on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, it seems uh, your, your um, issues that are described in your book are more about nationalist impulses, nationalist issues, but they don't really get to the question of identity per se. Uh, you, you have two different identities on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, leadership uh, by either Japan or the South Korean leader or uh, the U.S. leadership is really going to be able to address that in any uh, near-term uh, consequence. Second question is, in the last six months, or really since the emergence of the Trump regime, we're seeing much more of a bilateral emphasis on relationships. The two um, summit, uh, summits have been with China and Japan, and both focused on North Korea. Um, there was a, a mention in the 2 plus 2 meeting with uh, between the U.S. and Japan before the summit about, about the uh, coordination with Korea, with South Korea. But it seems to me that more and more the, it, the situation in Northeast Asia is set up now for much more of a bilateral emphasis, and it's really going to tee up and load up the agenda of whoever emerges after the uh, May 9th elections in terms of catching up to where the U.S. and Japan are in terms of security relationships, and in security responsibilities and attention to North Korea. And uh, that's going to be an additional burden for the leadership in South Korea. I was wondering if you'd like to comment on any or all of that. I'll, can I take the second one? I'll let you think a minute about the first. Um, I've got right. thoughts on that. But hey, no, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing here for a second. Um, I think you're right in regard to the bilateralism, but I think that reflects, if you will, primarily the, the predilections of the White House. That in a transactional bargaining, negotiating kind of context, you know, this is an administration that has pretty much disdained multilateralism generally and framed its relationship with the world primarily within bilateral relationships. And that, that, that context. And so I would expect that to continue. Um, the problem, of course, is, is that while the fine people work in the trenches at the state and, and, and Department of Defenses understand the value of, of multilateralism and the, and the larger sets of, you know, the trilateral relationship, particularly in Northeast Asia, um, you know, ships of state are inertial. And while they can continue to move forward, at some point that inertia runs out. And thus you need to have guidance and I think momentum provided by the top leadership. So we're back to where we started, which is, is that if we're going to move forward, then we've got to have the leaders vest themselves in a trilateral approach. And that doesn't seem to be the kind of the mentality that I espy or I sense 
among, you know, uh, in the White House. You know, and I think, of course, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, to some degree, less degree, and, and, and perhaps in the, in the Vice President understand that. But uh, we're going to find an, it's going to be an interesting case study in leadership and governance, quite frankly. Yeah, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction because, um, you know, we've had three cabinet level um, visitors to South Korea in the first four months of the Trump administration. Um, the real problem is actually uh, related to the costs and consequences of South Korea's political vacuum and the fact that they, uh, because of their situation, have not been able to find a way to engage at the highest levels uh, effectively uh, with the new administration here. Uh, and so it's actually generated uh, a public discussion. It was mentioned in the last Korean presidential debate about Korea passing uh, this perception in South Korea that they're being left out. But I see that more as a symptom of their own problems and as a fact that the new South Korean administration is going to be uh, playing catch up uh, and arguably uh, this uh, vacuum, I think, has had real costs for South Korea's ability to try to shape the agenda regionally as vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Uh, now they're going to be in a situation where they're going to have to adapt to a situation that has moved forward over the course of the past three or four months. Um, they'll have an impact once a new president gets into place, but um, it will be the sort of impact that has to un perhaps undo or challenge some things that Korea doesn't like rather than um, engaging and shaping. Uh, together with the United States and other partners. Are we going to tackle the national identity and nationalism question? Um, our main methodological approach to looking at identity was related to analysis of public opinion. Um, there is an active debate uh, on the peninsula about uh, in terms of contending identities, but that's something that we really set aside for the purposes of this research. Uh, Unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, left today. Uh, but there will be a paper uh, from this panel coming out in the next couple months. Um, did you guys write a book together, too? Did that happen? <laughs> it, we, we both tried to forget it, I think. It's been a, it's been a dark moment in our personal histories. But, uh. well. <laughs> okay. It's small print. Um. Well, please join me in thanking both Scott and Brad for being with, here, with us here today.